good morning, everybody. <clears throat> so good to see you uh, out on a uh, little windy but a beautiful Sunday day, and uh, so glad that uh, you can be here at our 930 service. Um, of course, many prayer requests. Just always ask you to remember the, the prayer needs of our church family and your families. But uh, especially remember uh, Betty Sizemore. She's been real sick since about Thursday and must be some type of strain of the flu or, or uh, virus. But um, anyway, most of yesterday, I think she got real ill and probably dehydrated. She was spent most of the day in the emergency room. And so Bob called and he, well, he stayed with her today, wasn't able to be here this morning. But she is back home. She's feeling better. But um, I know that, um, that he would want you to know about that and be praying uh, for her. Well, this morning, we are going to continue uh, looking at the Gospel of Mark, as we have been doing. We're in the latter part of Mark now. We've moved there. We're going to come back, but we're there as we march towards Easter. And in fact, this little series of messages is called the Victory March. We're looking at, at how Jesus marched towards the victory of the empty tomb and that we'll celebrate on Easter Sunday. But we've said week after week, uh, uh, Victory March feels good, and one reason it feels so good is that there's a lot of pain, and there's a lot of trial, and there's a lot of struggle, and there's a lot of effort to get that victory. And Jesus is going through that right now. And His victory is our victory. His march is so we can have victory. And we need to remember this and, and take it in and live it, especially this time of the year as we re-examine our relationship with Him. So this morning, we're going to be in the 14th chapter of Mark. And we have been looking at, the last couple of Sundays, Jesus' first moments of trial, Gethsemane, and then before the Sanhedrin in the middle of the night. Now what Mark does is... Um, it is very clever, but it's very important. Alongside of this, he wants us to know that there's two dramas going on here. There's the drama of Jesus on trial and suffering for our sin. At the same time, there's the drama of what's going on in the minds and the hearts of his followers and how they're processing this and taking this in and especially... Peter. And so, what we're going to talk about today, Peter, and how he is behaving during the beginnings of this trial, is there for a reason. Is that as we reflect on what Jesus does for us, we always have to reflect on what we're going through and how we're responding to what Jesus is doing for us. So, today's message is the fall of the hero. And sometimes we all think we're the hero. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But the gospel message today is from the 14th chapter of Mark, beginning with the 66th verse. Let's see the other side of the drama this morning. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When he saw Jesus warming himself... She looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said, but he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses, and he, he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me. Three times. And he broke down and he wept. This is the word of the Lord today. 
Well, a few things I thought about Peter as I read this once again. First of all, Peter's Achilles heel is revealed to us here in this story. Now, Peter is, let's get it up front here, Peter's not a coward. And he often gets tagged as being a coward that night. And, you know, I know many of us have said, and maybe we've said sometime when, we're ha- when we read this story, well, all I know is if I had been there that night, I wouldn't have denied Jesus, right? You know, I love Jesus so much. I know what he was going through. I know he was there for me. Um, I don't care what anybody said or what anybody did. I wouldn't have denied him like Peter. Peter said the same thing. And Peter didn't fail that night because he was afraid or because of his courage. Because we know, finding out who Peter is through the Gospels, Peter was a courageous man, probably one of the most courageous men in the Gospels. Think about it. Peter left everything he owned behind and followed Jesus. That took courage. He was the one with enough courage when nobody else wanted to speak up at Caesarea Philippi when Jesus said, Who do men say that I am and who do you say that I am? It was Peter who said, Thou art the Christ. Even though some may have been thinking it, he had the courage to say it. As Jesus began teaching about what was going to happen to him, his death and his suffering and and being this different kind of Messiah, Peter was the one bold enough to even rebuke Jesus for talking about it. He was the one just hours before in the garden, lashed out with his sword against overwhelming odds and cut off the ear of the high priest's servant. And he's one of only two disciples right now to follow Jesus into the night as he's tried. We'll see John at the cross, won't we? But only John, only Peter, the rest are fled. The rest are in hiding. Peter's life didn't give evidence of being afraid. It was a life of brashness, of blind courage, and loyalty to the end. But... His courageousness, that part of his character, is also the chink in his armor. It's also his Achilles heel. His courage, his brashness, also gets him into trouble a lot, doesn't it? After he said Jesus is the Christ at Caesarea Philippi, Jesus has to sternly rebuke him. Get thee behind me, Satan. You're not going to be, I'm not going to be that kind of Messiah. It's his eagerness to be with Jesus till the end that he makes this brash promise he can never keep. I'll never leave you, Lord. And even if it means me dying. In his courageousness, he tries to stay by Jesus. We saw a few weeks ago, he falls asleep while trying to watch Jesus pray. Peter's problem was not that he was uh, courageous. His problem was, his chink was, he was overconfident in himself. He was overconfident in himself. He thought that he could face any situation and overcome it. He didn't need anybody else, not even Jesus, when it came to tight squeezes. He would find his way out. And he thought this was the case now in his trial. It's almost as if Peter felt like he was the disciple, that he was the one Jesus had beside him so that he could be the protector of Jesus rather than the other way around. He hadn't quite learned yet it's Jesus that needs to protect us. It's Jesus that needs to guard us. Although... Not in a selfish, malicious way. Peter was self-centered, and his strength became his weakness. Satan then tempted Peter, not at his weakest point, where he'd be on guard, but where? At his strength, where he thought he was secure. And many a fortress has fallen from the surprise attack 
to the weak point, hasn't it? And that is the way it is with our fortress. Peter would learn an important lesson the hard way that night. And that was that he needed Jesus to help guard his heart. Then Jesus needed him to guard his life. We need our hearts guarded by our Lord. And it's the same for our journey. We must not get too overconfident with what we feel is our strongest Christian character. In fact, that's the the part of us that we should guard and improve on each day. Because the evil one does not want the least part of us. He wants the best part of us. He wants what we have most to give to Jesus. And he wants to take that away. He wants to diminish it. He wants us to be tempted and forsake it. Because he knows the best of us that Jesus puts in us is the way to defeat him, the devil. And that's what happens. So do not be lulled to sleep by overconfidence. Do not rely on the false security that you can handle any situation, any temptation yourself. And we'll be safe from falling to temptation only when we replace the confidence that boasts with the the humility that clings to Christ for our very support. That very thing, I mean, I've said it, you said it, I, I can't believe she did that. I can't believe he fell for that. I can't believe he was tempted for that and did that to his family. I can't believe she could even think that. I would never do that. You can bet you'll never see me doing that. You better watch out. Because that's basically what Peter is saying. I'm sure he said, I can't believe all these other guys. Where are they? Where's the other nine, ten that's supposed to be here with me? So in the midst, the other thing is that in the midst of Peter's failure is great courage. He still has courage. We see his courage come out again. And it says to us a few things about failure. First of all, failure in our life does not mean that we're weak. It just means we're human. We're all going to fail. And as we think about the tragic events of Peter that night, we can certainly point out an important truth that that. Failures don't mean that we're weak. Failing does not mean we can never rise up from our failures and do great things for Jesus again. It's the opposite. Somehow, as Christ forgives us, Jesus gives us power to become even more powerful, to have even a greater testimony, to even have a a greater service for Him because we fail. And if we're someone who has never failed, we're probably someone who has never put forth any effort or risked anything in life. We can live a safe life, can't we? You know, you can, um, you can sit in the same pew Sunday after Sunday and enjoy the wonderful music and feel close to the Lord and walk out feeling good and confident about yourself and never do anything for Jesus. It's risk that moves the kingdom. And Peter teaches us that. Some great truths about failure, spiritual failure. Peter didn't fail in cowardice, but he failed in bravery. He was so courageous that night. Most of us wouldn't have been in that position to fail. He had just cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest, and there he is in his courtyard. No wonder they recognized him. Even when he knows that that he's been recognized the first time, the second time, he's strong. His love and his loyalty for Jesus somehow keeps him hanging around at least, right? Most of us would have slinked away or ran away 
to not get into trouble. But the evil one keeps tempting him. The evil one keeps pressure on him. And Peter does end up failing that night. And he knows that happens when the rooster crows. But again, this is going to be his greatest victory. Think about what happens when the rooster crows and Peter recognizes his failure. In fact, one of the Gospels records that when the rooster crows, Peter looks around and one thing he sees, probably out of the corner of his eye, is he sees Jesus looking at him. Can you imagine? The rooster crows and and immediately Peter remembers his words and he looks around. He must have been very close to the trial. He looks up and by then Jesus' face is maybe covered with spittle. It bleeds from the beatings. He's worn down and he still takes the time to look at Peter. What a penetrating look that must have been. And when he sees the disappointment and compassion in Jesus' eyes, it all becomes clear. I think those, all those three years come together. And he says, aha, I get it. Because, you know, the penalty of sin for the believer, for the Christian, it's not the fear of punishment. We've taken care of that by grace. We're going to heaven. We're not going to hell. Christ has come into our life, but as we live this life and we still disappoint our Lord, it's not the fear of punishment, but realizing the pain and sorrow we've caused our Lord, isn't it? That's what grieves us. I've let him down again. How could I have done it again? And at this point, Peter breaks down and he weeps. Even the strongest of people even those that maybe you're one that tends never to cry. At some point, you've got to get broken by your sin and weep before the Lord. That takes great strength. At some point, to to be a strong follower of Jesus, you've got to reach a breaking point. It's easy for us to say that. We, We talk about AA. That's part of their thing, right? Until you reach the breaking point as an alcoholic, you can't be helped. Until you reach the breaking point as a sinner, you can't be forgiven. That courage has got to get stripped. That self-confidence has to be stripped. What did you do the last time the rooster crowed in your life? Did you fall to your knees and weep in repentance or did you brush it off as as something that would just pass in a few hours and continue in your old ways? I I did it again. Didn't want to do it. Tried my best. Did it again. Forgive me, Lord. Uh, Move on and I'm going to try not to let it happen again, but it probably will. Was it that careless? Or did it bring you to your knees? Failure is a fact of life in this world. At some point in life, everything is going to go wrong. And what we need to learn to do is to turn these failures over to Jesus and let him strengthen us. And it's only from failing and tribulation that true godly character can become a reality in our life. And it was the same way for Peter. Peter, I think, became even more courageous after this, didn't he? Even more bold. Now, let's remember back to the beginning of Mark. There's only one place that this story could come from in such detail. From Peter. Peter could have buried it. We could have never heard about it ever again. But remember, Mark is writing this gospel. His main source is Peter's preaching. And I think sermon after sermon, he hears Peter talking about this event as he wins others to Jesus Christ. He must have told that story over and over and over again. And he must have brought out the point that no matter what you do or how bad you think your sin is, Jesus is there ready to forgive you. I could even hear him saying, 
I sat there in Jesus' most difficult hour, and I denied I even knew him when he needed me most. But even in spite of that, Jesus never stopped loving me. That's a testimony. And you know we all have it. It's the same for us. Paul says that while we were yet sinners, or literally while we were in the very act of sinning, Jesus died for us. It's each of our testimonies. And that's how you win others to Christ. It's like the video of the man in prison <laughs> told how Jesus saved him. And he started a church. I'm sure Satan cringed every time Peter preached. <laughs> I thought I had him. And now look at this, he's turning it and bringing more believers to Jesus. There was a story about an evangelist, uh, Brownlow North, years ago. He was a man of God, but in his youth, he lived a wild life. Kind of like Mike. But, oh, sorry, Mike. But, I was thinking if you're awake over there. But one Sunday... He was to preach in a particular church, and before he entered the pulpit, somebody handed him an anonymous letter. Always be, uh, you know, always beware of an anonymous letter. Uh, and by the way, if you don't sign something, you, you write to me, you know, I don't even read it. So, I just, just a forethought there. But he gets this letter, and it, and it says, I knew you when you were young. And here's a specific thing that you did, and it was awful. I mean, it was awful. And he said, if you dare get up and preach here, I'm going to stand up in the middle of your sermon, and I'm going to read this. I'm going to tell people what you did and read this letter. And so the story said, Brownlow North went up into the pulpit, and he took the letter, and before he preached, he said, I've got a letter I want to read to you. And he read it word for word, and all the awful things he did as a young person. And he said, I want you to know everything in here is true, absolutely true. And he said, but my life has changed. Christ has forgiven me, and I no longer live like that, and I am saved, and you can be too. And needless to say, many men and women came to know Christ that night. And that's exactly what Peter did with his shame and failure. He, he told men, I hurt him, I shamed him, I denied him, I let him down, but yet he still loved me and forgave me, and he'll do the same for you. That's what salvation is all about, isn't it? We shame him, we deny him, we sin against God, and he forgives us. That's the good news. That's the good news. Tradition says that... Um, Later, when Peter would walk the streets of Jerusalem as a preacher and, and throughout Galilee and throughout the other world, that people that heard this story, his, uh, those that didn't believe in Jesus, they would mock him. He'd walk down the street and they would crow like a rooster to shame him. And I'm sure Peter just smiled inside and said, Thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to share what Jesus has done for me, to remember what Christ has done for me. Now, this morning, we have the great privilege of once again remembering what Jesus has done for us. All of us, but particularly you as an individual here, Jesus has died for each of you individually. If you were the only person alive, Jesus would have died for you. That's amazing. Only you, he shed his blood. Only you, he gave his body. And he leaves us this beautiful symbol of communion, of the Lord's Supper, to remind us that even if we're the most courageous people in the world, we'll fail him, but he saved us. So in just a minute, we're going to celebrate communion. I'm going to have a prayer and I've asked uh, Stephen and Tiffany to come up and help me. And uh, I want you to come up and um, receive the bread is the body of Christ and what he did for you. Receive the cup, the juice. It's the blood of Christ that's been given for you. It's a new covenant. Your sins are forgiven. And walk back 
knowing that you're forgiven, full of the grace of Jesus Christ, and then thank Him for it. Let's pray, and Stephen and Tiffany, y'all come up and help me, and after we pray and the music starts, we'll celebrate communion together. Just come up either station and take the bread and take the juice. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you again for what you've done for us, that even while we were in the act of sinning, you suffered, you bled, you died for us. Lord, we're going to remember you again now in a most holy way through communion. As we take the bread and, and the cup, Lord, may it be powerful reminders as individuals and as this community of faith called Fairview Baptist Church. We give this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen.